My name is Mason Carver, and this happened to me in June of 2012. I was a seasonal ranger at Yellowstone National Park, still a rookie with that idealistic fire in my belly. I'd always been a nature lover, thought working in a place as wild and majestic as Yellowstone was about as good as it could get for a guy like me. You know the Yellowstone everyone talks about, the geysers, the bison herds, the picture-perfect postcards. I was assigned to the park's remote southeast corner, the Thorofara. Rugged, isolated, the kind of wilderness that eats people alive if they're not careful. Best summer of my life, until it wasn't. My partner that season was an old-timer named Wyatt, a man of few words and a face weathered like old leather. He'd seen decades out there, and locals swore he knew every inch of those backcountry trails. First few weeks went as expected, mainly routine stuff. Fixing boardwalks, educating tourists, the occasional search and rescue whenever some city slicker got themselves lost. Looking back, it was probably the quiet that should have put me on edge. One evening, we came across a campsite that made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. The tent was shredded to pieces, gear scattered everywhere, and an abandoned campfire still faintly smoldered. Worst of all was the blood. Dark streaks splashed across rocks and smeared on the canvas remnants. Something bad had happened here. My first thought was a bear or a mountain lion gone rogue. But there were no tracks, animal or human, leading away from the ravaged campsite. Standard protocol kicked in. We documented the scene, radioed HQ, and awaited instructions. Wyatt kept muttering under his breath, something about it feeling wrong, but I chalked it up to an old man's paranoia. Backup arrived at daybreak in the form of a specialized response team. Trackers, hardened rangers, the kind you call when things go seriously sideways. I shadowed them as they combed through the area, trying to piece together whatever had happened. That's when they found the body. Or what was left of it. It was half buried in a shallow gully a few hundred yards from the campsite. From the visible parts, it was clear this wasn't any animal attack I'd ever seen. The team worked in grim silence, the tension hanging thick in the air. I tried not to stare as they unearthed the tattered remains. It was barely recognizable as human at all. The limbs were bent at impossible angles, the bones shattered, and there were marks, bite marks, but enormous and misshapen. Wyatt grabbed my shoulder, his grip surprisingly strong. His voice was barely a whisper. You see that boy? That's not natural. Something ain't right here. A cold dread settled in my stomach. The veteran rangers exchanged worried glances but didn't offer any explanations. After a day spent gathering evidence, they sealed off the area and told us to keep silent until further notice. The official explanation released to the public a week later. A tragic accident a solo hiker who'd fallen to his death. That night, over a few stiff drinks at the station, Wyatt finally spoke his mind. He told stories passed down by the indigenous tribes who once roamed the Thorofar, tales of a monstrous creature lurking in the wilderness, a hunter neither man nor beast. I scoffed, told him too much whiskey and not enough sleep were playing tricks on him. Wyatt just shook his head sadly. You think those stories came from nowhere, boy? Some things you just gotta believe to survive. A few weeks later, I was on a solo patrol when I heard it. The sound of branches snapping somewhere ahead on the trail. My heart pounded in my chest, and I cursed myself for venturing out alone. That's when I saw it. A towering figure, easily eight feet tall, emerging from the dense undergrowth. Its leathery skin was stretched tight over a skeletal frame, and its eyes burned in the dim forest light. It looked almost human, but every movement was twitchy, unnatural, like something broken controlling its body. I froze, the blood roaring in my ears. Had it seen me? I fumbled for my rifle, trying to remember every bit of training I'd ever received. In that split second the creature was upon me, 
It moved with a speed that defied its size, claws raking across my torso. I staggered back, raising my rifle, and unleashed a barrage of shots. The creature let out a piercing shriek, a sound that sent shivers down my spine, then vanished into the trees with blinding speed. I stumbled in the opposite direction, my chest burning. I ran until my lungs screamed and my legs gave out, collapsing onto the forest floor under the dimming light of dusk. Pain seared through my body, and I knew I was badly injured, but I forced myself up, stumbling through the undergrowth until I found a road and flagged down a passing truck. I spent weeks in the hospital, my body a patchwork of gashes and stitches. The doctors said it was a miracle I'd survived. Nobody believed my story about the creature. Official reports pinned it on a bear attack, and whispers swirled about my erratic behavior, the trauma. HQ offered me counseling, desk duty, anything to get me out of those woods. I turned in my badge instead. Some things you can't come back from. My name is Thaddeus Cole and this happened to me in July of 2016. I was a seasoned ranger working in Yellowstone National Park, or at least, I thought I was seasoned. Turns out no amount of experience can prepare you for some things. I grew up in Wyoming. These mountains are as familiar to me as my own reflection. Never thought they could hold the kind of darkness I was about to face. That summer was hotter than usual. We'd already had a string of brush fires, keeping the ranger stations on high alert. One morning, I got a call about smoke spotted near the park's remote northern boundary. Nothing too unusual, but protocol meant I had to go investigate. I geared up, figuring it would be a routine check. Disgruntled camper, lightning strike, the usual suspects. The trail to the reported spot wound through dense pine forests and fields of wildflowers. The sheer normalcy of it all contrasted with a nagging unease prickling at the back of my neck. I reached the area around mid-afternoon. No sign of fire, but the air hung heavy with an acrid, almost metallic odor. Whatever it was, it wasn't natural. Following my nose, I ventured deeper into the trees, scanning the forest floor for any signs of disturbance. That's when I saw the blood, not like anything I knew. No carcass, no body, but streaks and spatters staining the vibrant green undergrowth, leading toward a shadowy glen. My ranger training wrestled with an instinct telling me to turn back. Training lost, my boots crunched through the dry leaves as I descended into the darkness. The glen was eerily silent, the thick canopy of trees blocking out most of the sunlight. And there, at the far edge, I found the source of the blood. A bull elk. Not just dead, eviscerated. Its entrails were strewn around the clearing. Its ribcage cracked open as if by monstrous claws. I surveyed the scene, my stomach churning, trying to make sense of the savagery. A bear attack, maybe? Seemed unlikely. This level of methodical brutality didn't match any predator I'd encountered. I heard it then, a low, guttural growl emanating from somewhere behind me. I spun around rifle raised, and that's when I saw it. The creature crouched in the shadows, only partially visible. It was impossibly tall, its wiry frame draped in a coat of coarse, dark fur. Its eyes burned like embers in the dim light. The most unnerving thing was its intelligence. It didn't lunge like a rabid animal. It watched me, calculated. I knew, without a doubt, that it had done this to the elk. I squeezed the trigger, the roar of gunfire echoing through the glen. The creature didn't flinch. It rose from its crouch, and I saw it in its full, horrifying form, towering well over seven feet tall, its skeletal limbs ending in wickedly curved claws. It let out a piercing shriek that sent chills down my spine and charged. I sprinted through the trees, my heart thudding in my ears. Shots rang out the creature's unnatural cry echoing behind me. I ran, fueled by a desperate, primal terror, weaving through the dense forest. Thorns ripped at my clothes, 
branches whipped across my face, but I didn't stop. Behind me, I heard crashing and snapping branches as it pursued me with relentless fury. Finally, lungs burning and legs shaking, I stumbled out of the undergrowth and onto a dirt road. A couple in a dusty SUV stared at me in alarm. I scrambled towards their car, pounded on the passenger window, my voice a ragged rasp. Get out of here! Drive! Now! They didn't hesitate. The SUV peeled off as I collapsed onto the sun-baked road, struggling to regain my breath. In the rearview mirror, I caught a glimpse of the creature. It stood on the edge of the tree line, its silhouette monstrous against the fading light. We were safe, for now. As we sped towards the park entrance, I radioed for backup, trying to keep my voice steady despite the images flashing through my mind. By the time help arrived, the creature was gone. The investigation that followed turned up nothing, except for lingering traces of that sickly, metallic odor no one could identify. My official report described a possible rogue bear sighting. The other rangers looked at me with a mix of concern and skepticism, like maybe I'd lost my nerve somewhere out in the backcountry. I quit my post shortly after. No one believed me, and honestly, some days, I have trouble believing it myself. But I can still smell that acrid odor on the wind. I still see those glowing eyes in my nightmares. I moved across the country, hoping distance would help. Didn't matter. I work odd jobs now, mostly night shifts where I can keep an eye on the shadows. Each new town, each deserted alleyway, is a potential hunting ground. Sometimes I wonder if it knows I'm out here. If it remembers. The thing is, a part of me hopes it does. Because if there's one thing I've learned, it's that unfinished business has a nasty way of finding you. Maybe someday, out there in the vast wilderness, I'll get a rematch. Maybe someday, if I'm lucky, I'll be the one doing the hunting. My name is Wyatt Jensen, and this happened to me in September of 2015. I've been working as a ranger at Yellowstone for almost a decade. Married, one kid on the way. This place, it's wild. Untamed in a way you don't find in many corners of the world anymore. Makes me feel alive, you know? That is, before all this happened. Got a radio call about some hikers who hadn't shown up at their prearranged meeting spot. A couple who went off the beaten path to visit Shoshone Lake. Those off-trail types can be a real pain. Think they're invincible. But you gotta go out for them regardless. Drove to the rough area they were last seen in and parked the truck. Set out on foot around mid-afternoon. Should have been an easy job, few hours in and out, if I was lucky. The walk started normal enough. Quiet woods, dappled sunlight, usual stuff. After about an hour, the undergrowth got thicker, tougher to navigate. I slowed down, trying not to miss any possible signs of my lost hikers. That's when I saw the first sign something was wrong. A deer carcass not eaten, or not in the normal predator way. Bones were snapped, fur torn all to hell, like something monstrous had just batted it around like a toy. I got a bad feeling, drew my sidearm just in case, kept walking, following some tracks that might have been theirs, though the sun was starting to dip below the trees and it was getting hard to see. And then it got even stranger. The smell hit me first, this rotten, decaying stench that didn't belong in a healthy forest. And over it, something sweet and coppery. Blood, and lots of it. My stomach turned, but I had a job to do. I rounded a bend in the trees and nearly jumped out of my skin. In a clearing, there was... Well, at first, I couldn't even make sense of what I was seeing. It was a pile, a mound of bodies. Deer, maybe an elk, something big all ripped apart and tangled together. And then I saw them, the hikers, what was left of them, strewn about like they were playthings. One of them was missing a leg. God, it was like something out of a horror movie. My survival training kicked in. Whatever did this, 
it was probably still close. I slowly scanned the tree line trying to see anything out of the ordinary, any flash of movement. Nothing at first, but then, there, something massive, dark, up in the branches of an old pine. I squinted, trying to make out details in the fading light. It was bigger than any bear I'd ever encountered, hunched over with long limbs that seemed almost wrong somehow. Its head twisted towards me, and even in the gloom, I saw eyes, yellow, glinting with an intelligence that made my skin crawl. It dropped from the tree with an impossible grace, landing without a sound just meters away. Now I could see it properly. Must have been eight feet tall, covered in shaggy black fur that hung in clumps like it was half decayed. Its face, like a wolf, but stretched too long, and the teeth... Christ, those teeth were damn near as long as my fingers. The thing's gaze was fixed on me. It didn't make a sound, just slowly, deliberately, circled in a way that reminded me of how a tiger stalks its prey. I raised my gun, hands shaking like a damn leaf. I knew, deep down, this pistol wasn't going to do shit against something that monstrous, but I had to try. I fired emptying the magazine in what felt like seconds. The reports of the gunshots echoed in the deathly silent forest. The creature flinched with each hit, let out a low, guttural hiss, but it didn't go down. It stared at me with those terrible yellow eyes, and then it charged. I turned and ran. Didn't bother looking back, just ran for my life, branches whipping at my face, my breath tearing out of my lungs. I could hear it behind me, its feet pounding the ground, its harsh panting mixed with snarls. The clearing with the gruesome remains appeared up ahead, a flicker of hope. I fumbled for my spare ammo, reloading as I ran. Just as I reached the edge of the clearing, something snagged my ankle. I stumbled, sprawling onto the ground. The creature was on me in an instant, its weight crashing down, pinning me to the ground. Its stench was overpowering. I screamed, firing blindly up at it, emptying the second clip. It howled, rearing back. I saw blood spattered on its fur, but it was still alive, still furious. It lowered its head, those huge teeth inches from my face. My life flashed before my eyes, my wife's smile, the excited kick of my unborn baby against her belly. I wasn't ready to die. I wasn't going to be some creature's dinner out here, not without a fight. Pure adrenaline surged through me. I shoved upwards with every ounce of my strength, throwing the creature off balance. It staggered, giving me a precious second. With a desperate lunge, I snatched up a fallen branch, thick and jagged. I scrambled to my feet, holding the branch like a spear. The creature was already turning back, eyes narrowed. It wasn't used to its prey fighting back. Good. It roared, a bone-shaking sound, and charged again. I ran straight at it, screaming like a madman. Just as it reached me, I sidestepped, slamming the branch sideways into its ribs. There was a sickening crack, and it staggered to a halt, whimpering. I didn't wait to see if it would recover. I took off towards my parked truck, not daring to look back. I burst from the tree line, spotting the glint of metal through the approaching darkness. My heart soared until I realized the problem. My keys were in my backpack, still back in the clearing with... with everything else. Despair crashed over me. I fumbled in my pockets, some wild hope for a spare key. A miracle. Nothing. And then, I heard it. The thudding footsteps, the rasping breath coming closer. I had no choice. I dove into the truck and threw myself behind the steering wheel, scrambling for the ignition, for any weapon. My radio. Maybe I could still call for help, but as I grabbed it, the creature slammed into the truck's side. Metal screeched, glass shattered. The driver's side door was wrenched open with horrifying ease. I screamed, throwing the radio at its monstrous face. It roared batting the radio aside like it was nothing. I had nowhere left to go. It lunged, 
its impossibly long claws raking towards my throat. And then, headlights sliced through the night, blindingly bright. Screeching brakes, panicked shouts. Somehow, backup had found me. The creature hissed, shrinking back from the lights. Rangers piled out, guns drawn. They started shouting, firing. The woods erupted in sound and chaos. The creature hesitated, then turned and bounded away, disappearing into the darkness with shocking speed. I crumpled onto the ground, shaking uncontrollably. One of the guys, my friend Luke, rushed over, grabbing my arm. Wyatt, you okay? Man, you look like you've seen a ghost. I couldn't speak. I just pointed at the woods, my voice a hoarse whisper when I finally managed to get the words out. It's out there, I choked. It'll kill again. They took me back to the base, buzzing with activity. An all-out search was organized. ATVs, heat-seeking drones, the works. The hikers' bodies, what was left of them, were recovered. The deer carcass, too, dragged close to the search center for the scientists to go crazy over. I was the star witness, debriefed and questioned until I thought my head would explode. Nobody believed my full story, of course. Some kind of new predator, they said, maybe an escaped exotic animal mixed with who knows what. It fit better than the alternative, that I'd encountered something out of a nightmare, something older and darker than we'd ever imagined possible. In the end, they didn't find it. Whatever I saw out there vanished, leaving only the wreckage in the clearing and a scar on my psyche that I knew would never fully heal. I went back to work, patrolling the same woods, but they didn't feel the same. Every rustle of leaves, every shadow, made my pulse quicken. My son was born a few months later. I remember holding him that tiny, perfect life and swearing that I'd protect him, no matter what. And a darker thought whispered, too, that I'd teach him to be ready, to fight against the monsters, even the ones nobody wants to believe exist. We moved away from Yellowstone a year later, found work in a smaller park, quieter. My wife thinks it was the trauma, needing a change of scenery. Maybe she's right, but some nights I lie awake, listening to the sounds of the wind outside, and imagine I hear the heavy thud of footsteps and the rasping, hungry breath, and a low, guttural growl that haunts my dreams. Word gets around the ranger community, of course. The whispers about Yellowstone, about the thing I saw. Most dismiss it as tall tales, PTSD-fueled hallucinations. But a few, a select few, they look at me with a flicker of understanding in their eyes. A shared knowledge that there are things in the wild places of this world that defy all explanation. They say the woods are safer now that whatever creature I encountered was driven away, maybe even killed during the search. I hope to hell they're right, but there's a primal fear, deep-seated and unshakable, that says otherwise, that it's still out there, biding its time, waiting for the next hiker or ranger, foolish enough to wander into its territory. My name is Rowan Ellis, and this happened to me in August of 1997. I've been a park ranger in Yosemite for almost a decade. It's tough work, but somebody has to protect these mountains. Grew up hiking with my old man in the Blue Ridge Mountains, so woods feel more like home than my actual place. The summer of 97 started normal enough, chasing after kids trying to get too close to the waterfalls putting out illegal campfires left by careless weekend tourists. You know the drill. Then came the reports, whispered at first. Hikers saying they felt watched at night, seeing odd shapes flitting past their tents, hearing those weird growls in the dead of night. I'd heard it all before. Mostly overactive imaginations, fueled by firelight and too much cheap whiskey. Only, this time, it kept happening. Two weeks later, a camper went missing, just vanished. No body, no sign of a struggle, only the campsite looking like they'd run off in a hurry. That's when things got serious. 
The higher-ups sent in a search party, but nothing. I stayed on the case, felt it in my gut something was off about this whole thing. My boss, grizzled veteran named Walker, finally told me to back off. It's a damn bear, Rowan, or maybe a mountain lion. You're just spooked. I wasn't having it. Those tracks weren't any animal I recognized, and the way the campsite looked, it was calculated. Not like a hungry predator, but something smarter. One night I was out patrolling alone, checking the trails near Glacier Point. The air felt heavy, charged, and that prickling on the back of my neck that I'd learned to trust started up. I moved off trail, heading towards a creek where I sometimes spot deer. That's when I saw it. A pair of eyes glowing red in the darkness flickered behind a tree. Not animal eyes too high and the wrong shape. Something massive shifted in the shadows. Before I could react, it stepped into the moonlight. God, I wish I hadn't seen it properly. It stood close to nine feet tall, its body a grotesque mix of human and animal. Muscular arms that ended in razor claws, a long muzzle filled with sharp teeth. Shaggy brown fur covered its body, but its face... That was the worst part. It had intelligence, a twisted sort of cunning that made my stomach turn. It stared at me, head cocked, then let loose a guttural snarl that sent shivers down my spine. I fumbled for my pistol and fired. It snarled and lunged, disappearing into the trees. I stumbled back, tripped, and scrambled away as it charged again. I heard the crashing of branches the sound of its feet pounding towards me, getting closer. The next thing I remember is waking up in the ranger station, Walker standing over me, face grim. No sign of the creature. He figured I'd tripped, hit my head. I tried to tell him what I saw, but he just looked at me with pity, like I'd cracked. The rest of the summer is a blur. More people went missing, search teams turning up empty-handed. Walker started keeping me off the night shifts, said it was too dangerous. I felt like I was going crazy, caught between trying to warn everyone and this bone-deep knowledge that no one would ever believe me. Then came the night that changed everything. I was doing a final patrol before clocking out when I saw a group of campers set up near Half Dome. A family looked like. It made my blood run cold. Whatever was out there, it was getting bolder. I ran towards their camp, waving my arms and yelling for them to pack up and leave. They just stared at me in confusion, probably figured I was some unhinged ranger. I started explaining about the creature, but that's when I saw the eyes. Two fiery orbs in the darkness behind their camper. One of the kids, a little girl, saw it too. She screamed. The thing burst out of the shadows, a blur of fur and teeth. I yelled at them, told them to run. I pulled my pistol and fired, the shots ringing out in the still night. I saw the creature flinch, a spray of blood, but it kept coming. The family scrambled, trying to flee into the woods, but the thing was too fast. Leaping with impossible agility, it latched onto the man, its claws ripping through his back. I screamed, firing wildly. One shot caught the creature in the shoulder making it let out a howl and turn on me. I kept firing, moving in a frantic circle as it swiped at me with its claws, each swipe tearing the air and missing by inches. Out of the corner of my eye, I could see the woman grabbing her kids, making a break for the trees. I yelled for them to get the hell out of there, prayed they might escape into the darkness. The creature shifted focus, sniffing the air and turning in their direction. My heart hammered a desperate tattoo in my chest. I had to buy them time. I lunged forward, tackling the creature, wrestling it to the ground. The smell was overpowering, a mix of musk and rot. Its enormous weight pinned me down, those fiery eyes an inch from my face. I screamed into its muzzle, shoved my pistol up under its jaw, and pulled the trigger. There was a deafening explosion followed by a wave of searing pain as its talons sliced into my shoulder. I screamed and squeezed my eyes shut. Sure, this was the end. 
Just when I thought I couldn't hold on anymore, the weight on me lifted and the creature let loose an ear-splitting shriek of agony. I scrambled to my feet, clutching at my bloody shoulder. The creature staggered back, a gaping wound blasting smoke where its face had been. It thrashed and howled in pain, clawing at the air. My pistol lay useless on the ground. Then I saw them. The woman and her kids emerging from the tree line. They were safe. I stumbled back, tripped over a fallen log and crashed to the dirt, my vision swimming. The sounds of the creature thrashing faded, replaced by the pounding of my own heart in my ears. Had it run off? Was it dead? Either way, I had to get out of there. Pulling myself up, my whole body trembling from adrenaline and shock, I started moving. Stumbling, clutching at trees for support, I staggered away from the campsite. By the time I reached the ranger station, dawn was breaking. I collapsed into Walker's office, babbling my story. When he saw the blood, the claw marks slashing my arm, he finally seemed to believe, or at least believe I wasn't just some nut job. They found two bodies in what was left of the campsite, the father of the family, and another ranger Walker had sent out later in the night. There was never any sign of the creature again. They tried to say it was a rogue bear, but I knew better. Even Walker had a look in his eyes like maybe he'd seen something that night that changed his mind. In the weeks that followed, I became the park's resident expert on the Yosemite monster, if you can believe it. They moved me onto a desk job, pushing around reports of missing squirrels and vandalized outhouses. I tried to protest, but nobody was really listening. That was nearly two years ago. Most nights I wake up screaming, drenched in sweat. The image of the creature burned into my mind. I don't sleep much anymore. A month ago, my wife walked out. Said she couldn't handle it. Couldn't live with the fear. Can't blame her, honestly. The creature stole a piece of me that night. Something more basic than flesh. There's a darkness hanging around me. A sense that it isn't finished yet. Some days, when the fog sits heavy in the valley and the trees seem to lean in too close, I get a prickling on the back of my neck. I catch a whiff of that putrid smell, hear a growl carried on the wind. The other rangers laugh at me when I say this, but I know deep down, the creature is still out there, biding its time, maybe healing those wounds, or maybe just watching, waiting. I've started keeping the pistol under my pillow again. If it comes for me, it won't be a surprise this time. I'll fight it tooth and nail until the end. And maybe, if I'm lucky, take it with me. That's the best outcome I can hope for these days. They put a plaque up to honor the dead campers. Victim of a tragic bear attack, the inscription reads. I pass it sometimes, on my way to file those damn squirrel reports. Truth is, there are monsters out there far worse than any bear. People don't like hearing it, but it's the truth. I only pray that one day they'll believe someone before it's too late. My name is Kieran Finley, and this happened to me in August of 2002. Been working as a ranger in the Adirondack Park for most of my adult life. It's hard not to fall in love with the place. The tangled green mountains, the lakes like mirrors under the vast sky. Sure, you get the occasional bear encounter, maybe a lost hiker every now and then. But nothing the standard training doesn't prepare you for. Nothing like this. It started with the Wallace family. Two parents, three kids, and a golden retriever that was more enthusiasm than brains. They'd booked a cabin for a week, planning to do some light hiking, fishing the usual wholesome family fun. When they didn't check out as scheduled, a routine search was put into motion. My partner Ben and I were assigned their route, a short loop trail around a particularly scenic lake, nothing that would usually cause trouble. By the time we reached the trailhead, though, that familiar prickle of unease crawled up my spine. The Wallace's minivan was still parked at the lot, 
looking oddly out of place amidst the towering pines. The golden retriever sat in the back, staring out with a mournful whine. Something feels wrong, Ben muttered, echoing my own thoughts. We split up to search the surrounding area, combing through the brush with a growing sense of dread. That was when I found her. The youngest Wallace kid, a girl, maybe seven or eight years old. She was half hidden beneath a pile of leaves, her face pale and tear-streaked. I called out to Ben, dropping to my knees beside her. At first she just whimpered, clutching a tattered stuffed rabbit. Then, her words spilled out in a panicked rush. The monster! It took them in the trees! Her voice trailed off into a sob. I questioned her, gently but urgently. The story came out piecemeal, a jumbled tale of shadows in the woods, guttural noises, and the heart-wrenching screams of her family as they were dragged into the undergrowth. Her description was vague, filtered through the eyes of a terrified child, but two words stuck out. Big and furry. Ben joined us, his face grim. We radioed for backup, securing the area. There was no trace of the rest of the Wallace family, not a scrap of clothing or a single drop of blood. It was as though they'd vanished into thin air. The aftermath was a mess. The official explanation was a bear attack, but the complete lack of evidence, coupled with the child's terrified account, churned the rumor mill. Stories spread among the locals, hushed whispers about a creature lurking in the woods. I dismissed the talk at first, but that flicker of doubt, it had taken root in the pit of my stomach. There was no logical explanation for what happened to the Wallace family, and that left the door open to the impossible. My next patrol after that was different. Every snap of a twig made me jump. I scanned the tree line, half expecting to see a hulking shape watching me from the shadows. Ben noticed the change in me, the tension I couldn't shake. He chalked it up to the stress of the case, but he also started watching the woods a little more warily. One afternoon, we stumbled across something that made our blood run cold. Tracks imprinted in the soft earth beside a creek. They were huge, far larger than any bear print I'd ever seen, with long curved claw marks gouging deep into the mud. And there was something else. Something chillingly familiar in their inhuman, vaguely bipedal shape. We radioed for a forensics team, but by the time they arrived, a heavy rainfall had washed away the tracks. The photos and plaster casts ended up locked away in a filing cabinet somewhere, labeled inconclusive. Officially, the case of the Wallace family went cold, but Ben and I, we weren't so sure anymore. We started taking patrols together, refusing to be caught out alone with whatever was lurking in those woods. We kept an eye on the local chatter, listening for any sightings or missing person reports that fit the emerging pattern. People vanishing without a trace near the forest edge. One gray, drizzly morning, news came of another disappearance. A lone hiker, Joel Carter, an experienced outdoorsman with a penchant for going off-trail, hadn't been heard from for days. His old, beat-up truck was still parked at a trailhead in a remote section of the park. We were the ones who found him, or at least what was left of him. He was high up in the branches of a massive oak tree, his body mangled and torn as though some impossibly strong animal had pulled him apart. The sight turned my stomach. This wasn't a bear or a mountain lion. This was something different, something brutal and merciless. We reported our findings our voices flat and devoid of anything resembling professional detachment. They tried to explain it away, a freak accident. Maybe Joel fell and got caught in the branches. But Ben and I, we knew. The same creature that had taken the Wallace family was still out there. It was hunting. It couldn't go on. Whatever this thing was, it was getting bolder, taking prey closer to populated areas. We filed a report with the higher-ups, outlining every odd case the unsettling tracks, the whispers, and the growing body count. I think they humored us. Or maybe they wrote us off as two rangers traumatized by the Wallace incident. Either way, they denied our request for additional resources and a full-scale search. 
No creature, no threat, no action. We decided to take matters into our own hands. Armed with hunting rifles and a cold, desperate fury, Ben and I went back into the woods. We followed the fragmented trail of disappearances, mapping out a rough perimeter for the creature's territory. The deeper we went, the more the forest felt oppressive. It was too silent, even the birdsong eerily absent, as though the wilderness itself was holding its breath. And then, we saw it. A hulking shape, half obscured by the tangled undergrowth, moving with a terrifying grace. It dwarfed the surrounding trees, a monstrous silhouette of ragged fur and gleaming yellow eyes. For a frozen second, we could only stare, our minds grappling with the sheer scale and impossible reality of this... thing. Snap out of it, Ben hissed, and his voice cut through my shock. The creature was stalking towards us, a low growl rumbling deep in its chest. We raised our rifles, but my hands trembled. This was no animal I recognized. Logic and training crumbled in the face of its sheer unnaturalness. It lunged, a blur of claws, teeth, and rage. Ben fired first, his bullet finding purchase with a solid thunk. The creature roared, a bone-chilling sound that sent shivers down my spine. I fired too, more out of panic than precision, but the shots seemed to have little effect. It faltered, but only for a moment. Then, it was on us. Ben was my shield. I saw him grapple with the creature, his rifle knocked aside. His scream was short, cut abruptly as the creature's massive claws slammed into him, sending his body flying like a ragdoll. He landed with a sickening thud, his body crumpling at a grotesque angle. Ben! The name tore from my throat. Blind fury replaced the fear, and I fired at the creature, emptying my rifle with desperate abandon. It finally crumpled to the ground, its guttural growls fading into ragged gasps. I stumbled over to Ben. He couldn't answer, his eyes wide and filled with both pain and a terrible understanding. I pressed my hands to the gaping wound in his side, a futile attempt to stop the relentless flow of blood. He let out a strangled laugh, then coughed, crimson flecking his lips. Guess... Guess the stories were true after all, he rasped out, his gaze fixed on the unmoving form of the creature. I wanted to deny it, to tell him we'd get him out of here, that everything would be all right. But the lies died on my tongue. There was no help coming, not in time to save him, not in time to save any of us from the chilling knowledge that we were no longer at the top of the food chain. With trembling hands, I reloaded my rifle. The creature was still alive, its breathing labored. There was a flicker of dark awareness in its yellow eyes as it watched me. It knew, as we did, that this was far from over. I raised the rifle, a grim finality settling over me. The report of the gunshot echoed into a terrible silence. Ben closed his eyes, a single tear escaping the corner. I stood above him, the rifle clutched in my numb hands, and waited. The forest closed in around the clearing, holding its breath for whatever would emerge next. I didn't wait for backup. The next morning, battered and exhausted, I stumbled into the ranger station, my report a garbled jumble of half-truths and the grim reality that would never make it into any official record. I don't know if they believed me, don't know if they simply thought grief and trauma had broken me. Either way, I was quietly shuffled off to mandatory counseling and desk duty. No one spoke of Ben or the creature in the woods. His death was just another ranger lost to the wilderness. A year later, I quit the service. Couldn't face the trees the same way, the comforting familiarity replaced by a lurking dread. I couldn't forget the creature, its impossible size and those knowing, malevolent eyes. They said it was PTSD the haunting echoes of that day in the clearing. Maybe it was. I moved to the city, trying to find solace in the anonymity of crowds, the relentless drone of traffic erasing the eerie silence of the forest. It helps, most days. But there are nights when I wake gasping for air, 
the echo of that chilling roar ringing in my ears, my eyes wide in the darkness as I search for the monstrous shape lurking just beyond the window. The truth, the terrifying, impossible truth, has become my solitary burden. I saw the creature, tracked it, watched as it slaughtered those unlucky enough to cross its path. I fought it, and I lost. The Adirondack Park still looks the same on a map, a sprawling expanse of green amidst the bustle of the northeast. But I know what lurks in its deepest, most ancient depths. They try to write it off, dismiss the missing persons, the whispered tales, blame it on bears, explain it away with convenient half-truths. But those of us who've seen it, we know better. Some nights, I think about going back, there's a kind of grim satisfaction in the idea of facing down the monster, of going down fighting instead of cowering on the fringes of civilization. I keep a hunting rifle stashed in my closet, a constant reminder of the unfinished business out there. One day, maybe, I'll return to the forest. Not as a ranger, bound by protocols and bureaucracy, but as a hunter. Or perhaps, as prey. The thought sends a jolt through me, a twisted mix of terror and grim determination. There are battles fought outside the realm of official reports, monstrous truths that lurk in the hidden corners of the world. When I face the creature again, it won't be on their terms. It'll be on mine. Until then, I walk the city streets, another face swallowed by the urban sprawl. I look normal, unremarkable, the same as any other passerby. But beneath the surface, I'm the harbinger of a chilling truth. The battle-scarred veteran of a silent war humans were never meant to wage. They can close the parks, silence the stories, and try to sweep it all under the rug of normalcy. But the creature is still out there. And deep down, a part of me knows, this isn't over. My name is Kellen Scott, and this happened to me in August of 2014. I'm a National Park Ranger, have been for the last 15 years, bouncing from post to post. I've hiked some glorious trails, seen sunrises that'd knock your socks off. But I was stationed in the Mount Rainier area of Washington for the weirdest couple of months of my career. See, my job's not just about happy campers and keeping trails clean. We get all sorts, the lost, the injured, the occasional less-than-savory type looking for a remote place to cause trouble. What I dealt with was none of the above. The first sign was a missing person report. A solo hiker. Seasoned guy named Gary Beltran. Just vanished off the Wonderland Trail. I know that route like the back of my hand. A multi-day loop with plenty of spots cell service goes kaput. But Beltran wasn't unaccounted for a few hours or even overnight. It was a full five days before the call even came in. And get this, his family only started to worry when they got a bizarre text supposedly from him. Only it was all garbled, the words nothing but gibberish, like a cat walked across a keyboard. Weird? Yeah, but people get disoriented, phones glitch out. Not yet enough to make me think this wasn't some routine case. Two weeks into the search, we found a campsite just off the trail. Beltrans, judging by the gear. Here's where things turned from strange to... Well, there's no other word for it but wrong. His tent was ripped, like something big clawed it. There was blood. A lot of it. Not in splatter patterns, like from an animal attack, but in ragged streaks, as though something was dragged away. Whatever did that... It wasn't a bear, wolf, or cougar. We know their marks. This was deliberate and precise. I had this prickle down my spine like I was being watched. I filed a detailed report, but my superiors chalked it up to bad luck. We searched for weeks. Never found a body. I thought that was the end of it. Boy, was I wrong. A few days after Beltran's disappearance, there was another report. This time it was a young couple on a day hike. 
They claimed they saw something in the trees near Spray Park. Said it moved too fast, was too big to be any animal they knew. Dismissed as nerves, tourists see bears and mistake their size all the time. Still, I was on edge. It was like a dark cloud had settled over the whole area. Things escalated after that. Sightings became more frequent. Whispers started. Hikers passing each other on the trail, comparing notes. They all described the same thing. Massive. Moving with impossible speed. Always lurking in the tree line just out of sight. Then, the worst happened. It was two days ago. A ranger buddy of mine, Leanne, was doing trail maintenance a couple miles off. That's when the radio calls started coming in. People reporting screams from near her location. I grabbed my gear and took off at a dead run, calling out her name. When I reached the spot, Leanne was gone. There was another patch of blood, more torn fabric, that same sickening sense of something monstrous dragging her away. The other hikers were pale-faced, babbling about a huge, dark shape, eyes that glowed like embers. I'm writing this from a motel room outside the park. Got the hell out of there as quick as I could. I filed my report, but I don't think they believe me. They think it's stress. Grief over Leanne. Hell, maybe they're right. Maybe I've snapped. But I know what I saw. What those hikers saw. And most chilling of all, I know I wasn't the one being hunted. We were the bait. Something out there is impossibly big, impossibly fast. It stalks these woods, moves like a shadow. And the worst part? I think it's smart. I think it's learning. I haven't slept in two days. Afraid if I close my eyes, I'll see those glowing eyes in the dark. My name is Rowan Ellis, and this happened to me on June 12, 1997, while on patrol in Big Bend National Park, Texas. Rugged as hell down there, the kind of place that makes a man feel small. I've been a park ranger for most of my adult life, and I thought I'd seen it all. Lost hikers, the odd flash flood, even a tussle with a bear or two. But this, this was something else entirely. It started with a radio call from dispatch. A couple reported a strange sighting on the South Rim Trail, a large bipedal creature not matching any local wildlife. They'd hightailed it out of there, understandably shaken. Protocol demanded I check it out, despite the absurdity of the report. Bigfoot in Big Bend, huh? I chuckled to myself as I set off towards the trailhead but somewhere deep down a sliver of unease crept in. I reached the South Rim Trail in the late afternoon. The sun beat down with a vengeance, baking the desert landscape. I scanned the area. No sign of the panicked couple. No fresh footprints aside from my own. Just the vast, empty beauty of the Chihuahuan Desert stretching out before me. I decided to hike a short way down the trail, just in case. First half mile was uneventful. Then, amidst the rocks and scrub brush, I saw it. A footprint. Massive, at least twice the size of my own boot, with long, clawed toes. A jolt of adrenaline shot through me. That was no bear, and certainly no hoaxer. Whatever made that track was real, and it was big. I followed the trail of prints, my heart pounding a steady rhythm in my chest. They led off the main path towards a narrow, winding canyon. The sun was dipping lower, casting long, eerie shadows. Logically, I should have radioed for backup, turned around, but a stubborn determination fueled my steps. I had to see what made those tracks, had to prove to myself it was just some oversized critter, not the stuff of campfire legends. The canyon walls closed in around me, the air growing stiflingly still. The only sound was the crunch of my boots on gravel and the distant screech of a hawk. The prints continued, deeper in. Then I rounded a bend and my breath hitched in my throat. There, in a rocky clearing about twenty yards ahead, stood the creature. 
It had its back to me, hunched over a pile of... something. Even from a distance, its sheer size sent a chill down my spine. My first coherent thought was bear, but bigger, much bigger than any grizzly I'd ever encountered. Then the creature turned its head, as if sensing my presence. My blood ran cold. This was no bear. Its head was huge, bald, inhuman. Its face elongated, ending in a protruding snout filled with jagged teeth. And those eyes, small, black, and glinting with a chilling intelligence. In that moment, time seemed to slow down. The creature straightened, rising to its full height. A guttural growl rumbled in its chest, and it stood well over eight feet tall, covered in a coarse, dark brown fur. Every instinct screamed at me to run, but my feet felt rooted to the spot. It was like staring into something primeval, something that defied reason. Then it charged, not the lumbering gait of a bear, but with a swiftness that defied its size. I snapped out of my daze, fumbling for my rifle. I fired, more out of a desperate need to do something than with any real hope of stopping it. The creature stumbled, letting out a roar that echoed through the canyon. I fired again and again, my shots hitting their mark, yet they seemed to do little more than enrage the beast. It was closing in fast, those wicked claws outstretched. Panic kicked in. I turned and ran, stumbled down the narrow canyon path, the creature's roars and the pounding of its feet close behind me. The terrain was rough, treacherous, and I nearly twisted my ankle twice. Up ahead, a flicker of hope. The canyon opened up slightly, leading to a wider wash. If I could just reach it, maybe I could put some distance between us. A surge of adrenaline gave me a final burst of speed. I stumbled into the wash, sucking in ragged breaths. I turned, raising my rifle, expecting to see the creature lunge out of the canyon at any moment. But nothing came. Silence settled thick over the desert. I waited, strained my eyes towards the canyon entrance. My heart lodged in my throat. After what felt like an eternity, I cautiously lowered my rifle. Still nothing. Whatever it was, it had retreated. For now, I inched my way back towards the canyon entrance, gun raised, ready for another attack. But there was no sign of the creature, no blood trail, only those monstrous footprints disappearing back up the canyon. Had it only been wounded, waiting for me to make a mistake? The thought sent a shiver down my spine. I had to get out of there. I turned and jogged back towards the main trail breaking into a full sprint the moment the canyon was out of sight. I radioed for backup, my voice hoarse with fear and exertion. The words sounded ridiculous even to my own ears. Unknown creature, possible threat, requesting immediate assistance. The sun was setting as I reached my truck. Backup arrived shortly after, a whole unit of them armed to the teeth. They found no carcass, no injured creature. Just my story and those monstrous footprints they sent me home on mandatory leave after that. Not surprising, given the unusual nature of my report. Doctors were brought in, poking and prodding, asking if I'd hit my head, if I'd always been one for tall tales. It was humiliating, made me question my own sanity for a while. But I knew what I saw. They wrote it off as an animal attack. Maybe a misidentified bear, they said. Maybe a rogue wolf. Whatever the official report stated, I could see the doubt in their eyes. I was Ranger Ellis, the guy who saw Bigfoot. Couldn't go back to work for a time. Not Big Bend, not anywhere. The nightmares were relentless. The creature's inhuman face, the bloodlust in its eyes, the feeling of those monstrous claws inches from my flesh. I'd wake up drenched in sweat, gasping for air. I ended up taking odd jobs, manual labor, anything to keep my mind occupied, my hands calloused. Drifted for a while, trying to leave that canyon, that creature, behind me. One day, about a year later, a package arrived. No return address, just my name scrawled on it. 
Inside was a newspaper clipping and a note. The clipping was from a local rag up in Wyoming, reporting a string of missing persons around Yellowstone Park. The note was short, written in a shaky hand. They're spreading. It wasn't just you. My blood turned to ice. The Yellowstone disappearances had made national news, but the theories were the usual. Animal attacks, inexperienced hikers, bad luck. But this note, it was confirmation that I was right all along. Those creatures weren't isolated, and the official cover-ups were only going to help them thrive. And in that moment, something shifted inside me. The fear and helplessness were still there, but they were outweighed by a burning anger. These creatures had preyed on innocent people. Hikers, campers, maybe others who, like me, saw a glimpse of the truth and were dismissed as crazy. Those creatures were a danger, a cancer on the wild places that were supposed to be safe. They needed to be stopped. I wouldn't let others suffer the same way I had. I cashed out my meager savings, bought a heavy-duty truck, outfitted it for long-term off-grid living. The plan was simple, as insane as it sounded. I'd follow the disappearances, track those things down, document them, gather proof. I couldn't kill them, but maybe I could expose them. Warn people. I had the skills, the woodsman's intuition. I'd spent years surviving in the backcountry. Now I'd become the hunter instead of the hunted. It was a desperate, possibly suicidal plan. But sitting back doing nothing while people vanished into the wilderness... I couldn't live with that choice, not anymore. The next day, I loaded up my truck and hit the road, heading north. Wyoming was the first stop, but I knew it wouldn't be the last. My quest, if you could call it that, had begun, and it wouldn't end until the truth was out there, or I was dead, one or the other. My journey took me to the remote corners of America. I followed rumors and reports of strange sightings, venturing into places most people avoided. Deep forests, desolate swamps, rugged mountain ranges. Locals often looked at me like I was mad. Some had their own stories, whispered around campfires, about things lurking in the shadows. But most dismissed me as another Bigfoot nut, a conspiracy theorist chasing shadows. I kept meticulous records. Every footprint, every torn-up campsite, every eerie howl in the night. My truck became a mobile command center, crammed with maps, field guides, and enough firepower to start a small war. With each new clue, a pattern started to emerge. The attacks were sporadic, but escalating. These creatures were intelligent, adaptable. They were learning. I came face to face with them three more times over the years. Once in the dense redwood forests of Northern California, once in the alligator-infested swamps of the Everglades, and lastly, in an abandoned mining town, deep in the Alaskan wilderness. Each encounter was harrowing, pushing me to the breaking point. Each time, I barely escaped with my life. News of my crusade leaked out into certain circles. I became a sort of shadowy figure, part boogeyman, part folk hero, amongst those who believed there were more things out there than met the eye. A few even contacted me with their own stories, tips, sometimes pleas for help. One such message was from a woman named Sarah, her voice trembling on the voicemail she left. Sarah's brother, an avid hiker named Ethan, went missing in the Olympic National Forest in Washington State. The official search was called off, but Sarah refused to give up hope. She'd heard whispers about my work, my reputation, begged me to come, to try where others had failed. Something in her desperation sparked a flicker of recognition. The Olympic Peninsula. Dense, old-growth forests. Remote trails. It fit the pattern. And if there was a chance Ethan was still alive, a chance those creatures held him, I couldn't say no. I arrived in the small town near the park a few days later. Sarah was waiting, a haunted look in her eyes. She clung to my presence as if I were a lifeline. 
we went through Ethan's last known movements, poring over maps and trip itineraries. It was a shot in the dark, I warned her, but she nodded grimly, the fire of determination burning bright. I respected that in her, recognized a mirroring of my own obsession. I ventured into the heart of the Olympics alone. It was slow, methodical work, days of scouring the forest floor, studying tracks, marking potential territory on my map. Those woods felt different, even to me. An oppressive silence hung over everything, a sense of being watched. It put me constantly on edge. One evening, as the sun began to dip below the canopy, I saw them again. Not just one this time. Three figures, hulking in the twilight. One was the massive creature I'd seen all those years ago in Big Bend, its size somehow even more terrifying now. The other two were smaller, but still monstrous. My heart hammered against my ribs, but the fear was laced with a white-hot rage. Something had changed. These creatures, they were bolder. I watched from my vantage point as they stalked a family of deer, their movements coordinated and chillingly efficient. Unlike those first desperate attacks in the desert and the swamps, this was a practiced hunt. They were getting better, stronger. Humanity, we were underestimating the threat.